Two men were responsible for photographing a large portion of the population of Dutchess County in the late 19th century. These two brothers would actually photograph thousands and thousands of people. A lot. They made a good chunk of money doing this too. And they were good at it. They were known for their craft throughout the state and even the country. We have thousands of these photographs in our collections here at the Adrian's Memorial Library. However, uh, most of the people in these photographs, we don't actually know who they are. Why is that? Two reasons. Number one, nobody ever took the time to write the person's name on the photograph. Number two, all the people who might have known who these folks are are long dead. However, we're going to learn about some of the people in these photographs in today's presentation of local history, the Vale Brothers. Well, hello there, fellow history nerds. My name is Shannon Butler, and I'm the historian for the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. Now, recently, we've managed to uncover some ledgers in our collections. These ledgers have been here for quite a while, but we never really realized what they were until a closer examination. These ledgers date from January of 1868 through June of 1879. They show the date the person came in, their name, what style of image they wanted, how many prints, the number of the image, and whether or not they paid. Sometimes there's even an address on where to send the prints, which gives us an idea of where this person lived. These corresponding ledgers and boxes and boxes and boxes of photographs that we have finally give us a better understanding of some of these people. And some of the names and faces inspired us to research and learn more about who these individuals are. So we're going to give you some of the stories tonight. Some of these people you'll already know. And some of them will be brand spanking new. J. Watson Vale began his studio as a project in 1868. At first, it was a solo effort and his little brother Alonzo Vale jumped in. As you can see here from these images, we have J. Watson Vale, who you'll notice is looking away from the camera. Interesting, considering he is the photographer. You also have his beloved wife, Mrs. Vale. And then we have Alonzo Vale. There's a lot of photographs of Alonzo Vale in our collection. And I'm not gonna lie, he's, he's pretty darn handsome. The studio got its start in 1868 when 19-year-old J. Watson Vale set up a shop at 254 Main Street in Poughkeepsie. Now his father and older brother were already businessmen. They were involved in insurance and real estate, so there was some money to work with. Alonzo also took up photography, and in 1872, J. Watson employed his little brother, and soon thereafter they began to refer to themselves as Vale Brothers. For 20 years, they photographed thousands of people. And in May of 1882, their studio was praised by the Poughkeepsie Daily Eagle. The article read, the quality of their work gives them a first class reputation all over the country. Here we have an image of Poughkeepsie right about the time of the Vale Brothers Studios operations. We're looking at Main Street heading east. We see the old courthouse on the lower right-hand corner. The old Poughkeepsie Hotel, which of course is now no, no longer standing, but it's a road heading past the modern day Civic Center. The Vale Studio would be right about here, just behind the offices of the Sunday Courier Building. And can we take a moment to appreciate the fact that there are two random dudes hanging out on the roof of the building right at the time this photograph was being taken. Now the first known photograph to contain an actual image of a person was this photograph right here, taken in 1838 by Louis Daguerre. Daguerre, does that sound familiar? 
daguerreotypes, the very first form of photography. This is actually a very busy street scene in France, but only one person can be seen because he is standing still long enough to be caught in the image. If you look closely, he's having his boots shine. That allows for the photograph to be made. Now, what about all of the carriages and people going down the streets? Well, they were moving too fast to be caught in the image. Back in those days, it might take several minutes of exposure time in order to get a good image. So I just hope that this guy was getting a really good boot shine. By the 1870s, people were regularly sitting for photographs. This image here is not the Vail Studio, but it is what all 19th century photography studios looked like. Painted backgrounds, props, furniture, a couple different kinds of cameras, depending on what size image you wanted. There were different options for purchase based on the records we have. Here we see someone wanted a vignette, which means an image slowly fades around the edges. Or this person here wanted a locket-sized image, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny little photograph to fit inside a locket. Now, one of the specialties of the Vales brothers was photographing children. With longer exposure times than we have today, one needed to sit still for at least 10 to 15 seconds in order to get a good sharp image. Now, of course, children are notoriously good wigglers. Now, in the very early beginnings of photography, say the 1840s, for example, the exposure time was several minutes long. People tended to remain very stiff almost as if their heads were propped up, and in some cases they were. Even with the advancements of photography in the last half of the 19th century, getting a good image of a child was challenging. By the time the Vale Brothers had set up shop, the exposure time had been drastically cut, but still, you needed to sit still in order to get a good image. So in many images, you will find children propped up in a chair, holding a toy, holding onto a bottle, things like that. Or, you'll find images like this. A child's parent would hide behind a chair and wrap their arms around the waist of their child. Today, these photographs are known as hidden mother images, or in some cases, hidden father, like this one here. Here we have Mr. James Osborne, as our ledgers have identified him. He's propping up his baby for this photograph. These images are fun because it reminds us of a different time period long before the days of Photoshop. And you might be asking yourself, well, why don't the parent just sit with the child and the two of them can have their photograph taken together? Well, it's all about the money. The more people in the photo, the more it costs. Now, another interesting category uh, that the Vale brothers were very good at photographing was pets. It's comforting to know that people were just as passionate about their fur babies back then as we are today. It cost a lot of money to get your photograph made back then. So to take that extra cash that you've saved and earned and spend it on a picture of Fido, that's a big deal. Once again, it took real skill to get an animal to hold still long enough to get a, the right shot. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this next image here this is how you know you're good at what you do. We have two of the greatest wigglers, a Jack Russell Terrier and a child. The Vale Brothers had skill. Once again, it really helped if the owner was there to hold on to their pet. As we can see here, this is the daughter of Harvey Eastman, Carlotta. As a matter of fact, we have a lot of images of Carlotta and her pups. So. It inspired me to want to learn more about her and why she loved having her image taken with her, pe her pets. I mean, I totally understand. I have lots of selfies with me and my dogs, but still, it's free for me to do it more or less now. It costs a lot more money back then. For Carlota, growing up in Poughkeepsie was a fabulous thing, especially when you're the daughter of the wealthy and dashing Harvey G. Eastman. Well, she was born in 1867 and lived in the Eastman Mansion. Later, she was educated at the Brooklyn Heights Seminary. Harvey Eastman married Mary Minerva, seen here, and they had two daughters, Cora and Carlota. 
Now we have a lot of photographs of Carlota and she's definitely living her best life in just about every single one of them. Whether it's her and her dogs or her in a fabulous dress or fabulous hat, she was clearly all about fashion. And of course, she did live in a mansion with lots of money, so life was good. But sadly, her father died in 1878. He was not yet 44 years old. Now the family still had money, to be sure, which meant that as Carlotta came of marrying age, she was a catch. In 1891, she married Mr. Frederick Usher of Buffalo. The wedding was all that anyone could talk about, with well over 1,500 invited guests. The married couple went on to have two children, but marital bliss did not last long. It appears that in 1897, Carlota headed out to North Dakota in order to get herself a good old-fashioned divorce. Now, it should be noted that in New York society, you did not get divorced. She had to go to an entire different state in order to pull it off. But returning here would not be easy. Society would essentially shun her. And poor Carlota ended life pretty pathetically. She ended up living in a boarding house in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and died there of pneumonia. Now, this death certificate says that she's uh, fairly young, and she was, but not that young. She definitely was more around her father's age, about 44, when he died. So I guess the moral to Carlota's story is, don't get married. Stick with your dogs. They'll never let you down. Another form of photography that we, well, we, we just don't really see these days that much is known as post-mortem photography. Now, since death occurred more frequently at a younger age from sickness or lack of proper vaccinations, death was a bit more frequent at a young, early age. It's not surprising to come across the occasional image of the dead, particularly children. Parents wanted an image to remember their own little ones by. So it's considered normal to snap a picture of them in their deathbeds or caskets. Sometimes they hadn't had the chance to get their child to a photography studio. It just wasn't enough time, too busy working on a farm or whatever. So sometimes the only chance to have some sort of remembrance of them was to get a photo of them when they died. As you can see, this image here is clearly taken in a family's home. We can see the blinds on the window in the background and this very elaborate couch. The record states that this was Mr. F. Warner's child, and you can just make out in pencil where it says corpse. What's interesting about this particular record is that 25 copies of the photograph were ordered. That's crazy rare. Usually in these records, people are ordering maybe six, maybe a dozen, sometimes 15 or 20 if it's like a Vassar graduate or something, but 25 photos of your dead child? I, there's more to that story. And now it's time for awards time. That's right. Our first category is dedicated to beautiful dogs. It was really, really hard to narrow down the contestants for this particular award. May I have the nominees, please? Thank you. I have the nominees here, and they are this adorable little terrier, this Jack Russell terrier, this Yorkshire terrier, or this fabulous Cavalier King Charles. And the winner is this miniature pincher. And yes, unlike other ceremonies, this one is actually ringed because this little boy here looks just like my little girl Daisy. Not sorry. Now, every once in a while, I would come across a name while transcribing these ledgers that just beg to be researched. Such is the case with this one right here. Boots, number 9577. 
okay. So I thought, well, oh, maybe it's a cat, a dog. So I looked up at the photographs and no, it wasn't an animal. It was this. This oddly dressed man. Photograph number 9577, Boots, is quite something to behold. So I decided to research this Boots fellow. And let me tell you, if you've ever done research before and you put in a word like Boots, about a bazillion things will come up in Google. Boots Van Steenberg, it turns out, was actually born in Kingston, New York, to a fairly well-to-do family. His real name was Tobias Van Steenberg, and they called him Boots because he apparently liked to wear really high boots. Uh, right, right, right there with you, buddy. Now, at the time, and when he was a young man, he was considered tall and good-looking and, and fairly well off, but that would all change. Turns out that our boy Boots fell in love with a singer from Sweden. Her name was Jenny Lynn. Jenny Lynn was apparently all the rage and she was touring and heading to New York City. So Boots went down to see her. Boots wanted nothing more than to meet his beloved Jenny Lynn. However, security guards stopped him. Apparently that was a thing back in the 1860s too. For poor Boots, apparently if he couldn't have Jenny, he didn't want anyone or anything. And from then on out, he became kind of a weird hermit. He was famous for giving entertaining and long speeches on the 4th of July. Newspapers sometimes made fun of him, like the Buffalo Inquirer that called him the hermit lover of Jenny Lynn. The Poughkeepsie Journal also referred to him as Rear Admiral Boots Van Steenberg. He tramped his way around the Hudson Valley, giving speeches and just making a name for himself. He was found dead in his cabin in 1898, lying there with a smile on his face. Some historians like to believe that in death, he finally got to meet his beloved Jenny. I hope so, Boots. I hope so. Here, we have a very well-known figure. If you don't know his face, you certainly know his name. This is John Peter Adrians. He was born right here in Poughkeepsie in 1825, and he made a fortune in the mowing and farm equipment business. His factory was right down on the waterfront. If you're ever sitting in Shadow's restaurant enjoying a nice cocktail, well, that's where his factory once was. From the 1850s until about the 1920s, it employed several hundred people right here in Poughkeepsie. And of course, it was his money that would eventually be donated by his children for the creation of the very library where I'm sitting. In 1882, the Poughkeepsie Eagle News mentioned that the Vale Brothers had the latest novelty, which was instantaneous photography. The use of bromo-gelatin dry plates would allow for a second of exposure time. This made life much easier when photographing those notorious wigglers we were talking about earlier, kids and pets. Right about this time, you had guys like George Eastman Rochester, New York, doing their thing, right? Kodak. Oh, and by the way, George Eastman was first cousin to R. Harvey Eastman. Do you recognize this handsome young man? How about now? How about now? This is 
future President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It's nice to think that he and his family would hop in their carriage up in Hyde Park and drive on down Albany Post Road a couple miles to Main Street in Poughkeepsie to have their photos made. It's very cool when you think about it. And it's time once again for Awards Time! This category is a category devoted to fashion and faith. This award goes to the person with the largest crucifix. That's right. A category is dedicated entirely to those who really, really love broadcasting their faith in their fashion. We have some real doozies here. Let's take a look at the nominees, shall we? First up is an obvious choice. This lovely nun. Now she has a cross and a rosary, so technically she has two crucifixes. That's pretty good. Our next nominee is this lovely lady right here. Now her cross is made entirely of pearls. Very fancy. Our next nominee is Miss Hattie Slate. And she does have a fairly large cross. Definitely. But the award goes to none other than Miss Ida Kish. That is a big crucifix. And not only that, look at the size of that chain. That looks like it weighs a ton. Probably. Probably. Now we come to a story that had me a little perplexed. You see, in our ledgers, there were two different Charles Barnes. And in our photographs, there are two different Charles Barnes. Who's who? Well, further examination would prove that I got my first theory wrong. It happens. My first theory was that there was a Charles Barnes who owned a furniture shop, which is true. And there are Charles Barnes that was a civil engineer. That's also true. And that this man here was the furniture shop owner. This man here was the civil engineer. I was wrong. In fact, this man here is the furniture shop owner. This guy here, I don't know what he did, but he's definitely not the civil engineer. The civil engineer, engineer died young and never married. This guy has a wife. Okay, do we got this? This guy here, furniture shop owner. Now he would later marry. But first, he had to have lots and lots of pictures taken of his beloved dog, Fritz. I get it, you like your dog. He's cute, definitely. Then he gets married. Here's his lovely wife here. Then they have two children. So, couple different Charles Barneses, couple different families, couple different things going on. And sometimes you just gotta do a little bit more research to find out who's who and what's what. It's not always easy. Here, we have another interesting story to tell. This one is of a doctor, a female doctor. One of the first, in fact. This is Dr. Helen Worthing Webster. Here we have her sitting with her niece in 1878. And here she is again. Helen was born in Boston in 1837. She enrolled in the New England Female Medical College in Boston. And at the age of 25, she took her place in the ranks of the first female doctors in America. After graduation in 1862, she headed down to Washington, where she would serve as a doctor with the U.S. Army. It was there she met her husband, Dr. William Webster. Later, Helen was appointed assistant physician at the Boston's New England Hospital for Women and Children. In 1874, she had a new appointment at Vassar College. Now, at her time at Vassar, she was a big advocate for sports. She wanted girls to stay active, physically active and, and healthy. She was a big fan of Vassar's new baseball team. 
Now it's said that she kind of got herself into a little bit of trouble when one of the girls who was playing baseball uh, hurt her ankle. And when they took her to see the doctor, that doctor says, you might not want to tell anybody about your hurt ankle. You should just get over it because if everybody finds out that girls are getting hurt playing this baseball thing, they're going to cancel it. And eventually they did. A lot of concerned moms going, I don't want my daughter playing these terrible sports and hurting their precious hands and so forth. So anyway, in her time there, she did try her best to defend baseball for women. In our collection, there are several images of this man here, Frank L. Schofield. He was born here in Poughkeepsie in 1856 and began his career in music at an early age. He picked up the flute, as you can see here, and he began making public recitals as a teenager. He would stay a public performer for over 70 years in the area. He joined up with the famous 21st Regimental Band, which for a long time people believed was formed during the Civil War. In reality, that was actually formed before the Civil War and would continue to play later on for the National Guard. Schofield went on to become the leader of the 21st Regiment Band, and he also formed his own orchestra. Frank continued to perform up until his retirement at the age of 91. He died less than a year later in 1947. The Vale brothers also managed to get images of important local events. Like this, for example, the creation of the Poughkeepsie Railroad Bridge in 1887. Here you can see they hopped on a ferry and headed across to the other side of the river to snap a shot. They climbed up the hillside to get this very cool image. A year later, in 1888, the brothers were photographing the massive blizzard that took place in March. It buried the city of Poughkeepsie in several feet of snow. Here we see Main Street. This is just outside of their studio. That is a lot of snow. It's time once again for awards time. Now, since this is based on a program, a live program that I did via Zoom, this particular category, I let everybody vote themselves. I, I didn't want this entire thing to be rigged. So this category actually has votes from other people besides me. The category is Silliest Image. Let's look at the nominees, shall we? First up, we have the Amarita Club, decked out as silly policemen. The man all the way to the left is none other than Alonzo Vale, the little brother of the photography team. Our next nominee is this giant man baby, Mr. George Sherman, complete with bonnet and doll. And our final nominee is this, three silly dudes. From top to bottom, we have George Collingwood, John Adrians, and James Reynolds. Reynolds was actually a local actor. Now the votes were pretty close when we did this program a while back, but the favorite was hands down, Three Silly Dudes. Now here in the local history room, we like to refer to our next interesting character as the patron saint of local history. This lovely lady right here is none other than Helen Wilkinson Reynolds. Here she is with her parents, looking so cute. She was born and raised right here in Poughkeepsie. She was, of course, one of the founders of the Dutchess County Historical Society. She wrote and researched several articles, a couple of great books on local Dutch architecture. She was very good friends with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Actually, they were both friends long before he was president because they were both local history nerds. Vale took a couple of photographs of Helen Wilkinson Reynolds and we're so happy to have them because she really was one of the few people that was working so hard to preserve local history way back 
over 100 years ago. So, as we have seen, the Vale brothers were responsible for photographing lots and lots of people and events right here in this area. They were well respected for their work as artists in the media of photography. However, after 30 years of business, the brothers decided to call it a day in May of 1900. They sold their studio and their equipment and moved on to new things. Jay Watson Vale actually retired after closing up the business and he died in 1922. His brother Alonzo went on to become a, a major part of the community working for an insurance company of Vale, Sutton, and Vale. And he would continue to do his part in any way he could for the people of Poughkeepsie until his death in 1929. We consider ourselves quite fortunate to have all the images that we have, even if we still don't know who everybody is. They show us a lot about the people of this area, their style, their interests, their personalities. As I have always said, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then photographs are some of our greatest documents. I hope you enjoyed this little presentation on the Brothers Veil. Vale. Thanks very much for watching.